Hello, you're listening to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, presented by Brandon Elliott. This show will be going over all aspects of real estate investing and is intended to educate, motivate, and prepare you to take action on your first or next real estate investment. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Thank you for listening and enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Elliott. Today's episode, we're going to be diving into some awesome content. This gentleman has a heart of gold. We're going to dive into just nonprofits, actually setting up a for-purpose business, what that exactly means. And we're also going to talk to you guys about the lending side with all the chaos and crazy things that are going on out in the world with real estate and coronavirus. I have plenty of friends that their loans are just stopping. So there's some new criteria that's kind of needed. We're going to talk about the traditional side, the benefits behind that and so forth. But this episode is going to be really geared towards the understanding of for purpose businesses and giving back. And the understanding behind that is very, very crucial. It's helped a lot of entrepreneurs really get to that next level once you really start understanding the importance of giving. And we're going to have some awesome stuff that we're going to be doing at the very end of this as well. I want to give out some extra things at the end, but we'll talk about that at the very end. Make sure you guys let us know how you guys feel about this. Hit that subscribe button and leave a review. Let me know what you guys think. But Larry Tucker, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? What's up, brother? I'm doing great, man. I'm just here, you know, quarantining like everybody else, but off to an awesome Monday, you know, just stoked to be here. Happy to be a part of what you guys are doing, you know, with everything uh, that's been going on. It's just uh, awesome to see my entrepreneur buddies like yourself just staying strong, staying motivated and, you know, just doing so much to, to succeed even when things are, are a little bit uncertain, right? Yeah. I mean, with quarantine right now and like the whole yeah. stay at home and everything, like who would have thought we, we would have ever been in like a time like this, right? There's so much crazy. crazy. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of mm. nonsense going out there right now. So, you know, everybody that is tuning in, I pray for you guys. I hope everything is going well and you guys are yes. staying just intelligently smart with not with all the craziness that's going on out in the world and, and staying away from the damn news. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Turn that stuff off for sure. <laughs> but Larry, for anybody out there that doesn't know exactly who you are, do you mind just diving into who you are, where you're from and what you're about? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like you said, my name is Larry Tucker. I'm from San Diego, California. Actually, I was born and raised here in San Diego. Yeah. And my mom's no, if, actually from- If we weren't on quarantine, we could have done this in person. You know, Exactly. We totally could have done this in person if it wasn't for the quarantine but 10 feet apart you know we're good <laughs> so six feet apart but anyways so yeah from San Diego California my mom originally is from Tijuana Mexico so a lot of my family is from there so grew up kind of you know living this lifestyle on both sides of the border sure. and you know went to uh, Point Loma Nazarene University in college and actually that's where I first I got inspired to get into real estate investing. I was lucky enough and pretty fortunate to have a professor in college named George Fermanian, who was a very successful real estate investor who taught the real estate class. So he totally like, you know, gave a pass a lot of wisdom down to us, got us excited and motivated to think that we can get into a flip. And he started out like as a gardener and had this cool, you know, self-made story and even invited us to his multi-million dollar beach house in La Jolla one day to, to learn about flips and give us do like a Q and a thing. I was shocked that only like 10 out of like 80 people in the class actually showed up, you know, which is crazy mind boggling to me, but you know, it's cool when you have those types of people that are there to, to be able to pass down, you know, wisdom from, when you're first getting started to just be able to believe in yourself. He helped me check out my first deal. And that's how I was saving up money to be able to get, you know, my first deal done, which he came and checked out after that. I really fell in love with real estate. And I was like, man, there's, you know, a lot of opportunity here. And, you know, you work so hard for an hourly wage, but then you start to see, you know, the potential in real estate and, and, you know, doing these things on your own and, and it's exciting. So, you know, got into real estate investing, you know, about, five years ago doing some flips and things like that. I did about nine flips in San Diego. So not a ton, but did a few here in San Diego and then have a few multifamily properties here in San Diego. I got into some buy and hold 
and then I actually recently got my license about eight months ago, NMLS license as a mortgage lender. So I've been working with Cardinal Financial Company, doing more residential mortgage lending, and that's been a whole crazy, you know, storm since I since I joined this whole world. But it's been cool to be able to come into this world from an investment background and, and a real estate background to really be able to have a heart of trying to help people solve problems that they might not even know that, you know, what their options are. A lot of people don't even know, you know, what kind of options are available to them with conventional or with uh, traditional financing, like what we offer at Cardinal or things like that. So anyway, to keep blabbing, but that's a little no, bit. No, I, I love <laughs> that. That's, uh, you got a lot of things going on, right? You, you've mm-hmm. done a lot to help out a lot of people. So, you know, the list goes on and on. So where you got the inspiration originally was basically your teacher at the time from college. And what class was that exactly? That was actually a real estate class. It so, was a real estate class. Yeah, okay. it was a real estate class. And the professor, it's funny because, yeah, it was, uh, I was like, man, you know, I, I didn't really enjoy college a ton because I was wanting to go out and make money. And I was like, man, I'm just wasting so much time learning about God knows what, right? So I'm, I was always like excited to move past that. But he had one of the few classes at, at school that I really just, you know, I, I was able to respect him and be like, man, this guy was extremely successful in what he did, which is what I want to do. And now he's teaching, you know, because that's his way of giving back. So it's somebody that I really admired, respected, and wanted to learn from. And, but yeah, that was from my class at college at Point Loma Nazarene. Okay. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. So let's talk about your, your real estate experience so far, because the last several years you've been doing fix and flips here locally, correct? Correct. Okay. And then you, you've done a few other things like wholesale. Yeah. And, I've, hold, I've wholesaled a few properties. I got into Airbnb a little bit, but I actually ended up selling that property off recently. Uh-huh. Um, and then I have some long-term buy and holds, some, a couple duplexes here in San Diego as well. Sure. Okay. So what kind of learning curves have you experienced with your overall knowledge so far and getting out there and actually doing some of these different strategies in real estate? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm definitely more of like a learn as you go type of person. And I sometimes I'm like, yeah, exactly. So sometimes I'm like, jump both feet first, like, I'll, you know, I'll figure out how to do it as I'm doing it, you know, and that's kind of uh, what's caused me to be able to get in, but also have some experiences that have been very humbling as well. And, you know, not being as cautious from the very beginning. And that's come back to bite me in the butt as well. But a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing and a curse. (laughs) Exactly. So we could definitely talk about some of those, you know, because my first couple flips, I was fortunate enough to where, you know, they went really well. And then I got a little bit overconfident and, you know, was not making the right decisions about doing my due diligence from the beginning. And that did end up coming back to bite me in the butt later. But, you know, definitely the fix and flips is really what I got started with and what I really love doing. And then that, you know, transitioned into just so many other things. But as you know, with real estate, it's just like an ecosystem. And there's so many, you know, when you know how to exit a property, you know, several different ways, or, you know, you could turn it into an Airbnb, the more you know about these different strategies, obviously, the the more exit strategies you have. And one of my biggest mistakes starting out was only having one exit strategy, right? Like, I'm gonna fix a house, I'm gonna sell it. That's it. Yeah. (laughs) And then you get in and then you realize like, dang, you got to have more exit strategies than that. Because, you know, as you can see, you know, the market starts to shift all these different things. And uh, you talk to other investors that are like, man, I had like nine exit strategies. And I'm like, whoa, I just thought I'm gonna fix it, sell it, and everything's gonna go perfect, right? But that's not always the case. (laughs) I I love that. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Because I've been telling people this for the longest time, like have multiple exit strategies. And usually the people that find themselves in those tight situations and find themselves failing at whatever that type of real estate transaction is, usually it's because they started with like plan A. And then once that fails, they just jump to like plan Z right away. It's like, well, yeah. you know, I just got to take the loss. Exactly. Of, there's so many other ways that could have potentially, you know, maybe mm-hmm. worked out. Yeah. But, 100%. Yeah, man, that's tough. So with kind of transitioning into the mortgage and the lending side the last eight months, what inspired you to go that route? Yeah, so mortgage lending was something that, you know, I had kind of tried all these different areas of real estate. When I was 18, I went out and got my real estate agent license and then, you know, tried to get into investing as quickly as I could in in the flips and did a couple wholesale deals, some rentals. So I'm like, well, how many other things are left that I can like, how, how many other things can I learn about? And lending was one of those things that I was always curious about, but never really, you know, didn't under, fully understand it and what the options were and, you know, how to become a lender. But yeah. once uh, I have a family friend that, that's that been doing it for about 25 years and, you know, she kind of inspired me to, to get into it. And what I liked about it was, you know, it allowed me to 
to help people in so many different ways that, you know, you, you start to, as you, as you do this sort of thing, you start to realize and understand that there's such a lack of education out there with traditional financing and options people have when they fall behind on payments and things like that. And so you see these people get themselves in these crazy situations that they shouldn't have ended up in or that could have been avoided in the first place. Um, and so uh, like, honestly, the, the wholesaling thing was what first kind of led me into that. But being able to help people in these situations, you know, I really liked. And then being on the mortgage lending side, you know, I've been doing this more virtually. So especially with this whole coronavirus thing and everything, I'm like, man, this is cool because I can work from home. I can help people, you know, over the phone and I can do this in, in many states at the same time without necessarily having to be there. You know, so it worked out with this whole pandemic. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think a lot of things are going to have to adapt moving forward just in case and to be exactly. able to do that at home type of style and run business, which... I'm okay with because, you know, yeah. we've been doing it that way for a long time now, but it is good to, to have those backup, I guess, scenarios for a lot of other companies and industries out there. Now, mm-hmm. you mentioned just a, a few minutes ago, you know, becoming an agent when you're around 18 or so right out of high school. Do you think that was beneficial or needed? Has it helped you along the way uh, as being an active investor as well? Yeah, so it's kind of like a double-edged sword with being an agent because on on one side of it, it's like you have more of a liability. So just because I am a real estate agent, right, when I try to pick up a property from a seller directly, I have to disclose to them that I'm an agent. And then if I'm buying, if I'm trying to buy their home for under market value, I have to have them sign a document acknowledging that they know that I'm an agent and that they know that they're selling me the property below market value and, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So Oh, I'm sorry. That, which that part sucks because that part it's sucks. like, hey, just so you know, I'm getting a good deal here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that part kind of sucks because you're kind of held to, you know, and if you don't do that, somebody, you know, years later can come back, sue you and say, hey, they took advantage of me. So that part kind of sucks, you know, having a little bit more liability. But the, you know, the part that was good about me doing it was just being able to, you know, and for me, not to say that you can't have access to some of these things because you don't have to have your real estate license to have access to the MLS or, you know, some of these sorts of things. But just getting my license, I would say, allowed me to, like, learn about a lot of different things, be a little bit more, you know, in tune with the market, you know, being boots on the ground and really having access. Like, if you're at a brokerage, then, you know, potentially you have access to deals before other people do or different things like that, right, just by building up a network. But one thing that really has served me is really not using my license because I have it, but I really have have used it very few times because I, as you know, like most of the time, if you're trying to, you know, get, get a deal under contract to wholesale it or, or any other thing, you know, you're going to not use your license so that they don't have to pay fees or, or maybe you want to work with an agent and incentivize them. So you tell them, hey, I'm, you know, if you find me a deal, then obviously you're going to get the commission. So I wouldn't want to, you know, make it too known that I'm an agent because it's like, because you want to be able to leverage some of those partnerships, right? So I haven't really used my license because I've, I've rather given that commission to other people, you know, for the sake of kind of getting access to deals or things like that. Yeah, especially out in this market, like San Diego, the last couple of yeah. years, a lot of deals have been able to kind of go down that way by offering to the agent, the listing on the back end and so forth, mm-hmm. or, you know, compensate them up front to be able to exactly. get like the, the deal a little bit better, I guess. Or incentivized. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of one tactic that, I, that I've used and just, just so that you can really strengthen those relationships with those agents, you know, because obviously if they see that you're listing the properties, if they see that you're, you know, an agent that's more active, they're probably likely not going to maybe want to work with you as much or maybe work with an investor that isn't right. So, yeah. So let's talk about the, the benefits of traditional financing. I guess overall, give us the breakdown of what is needed for traditional financing to see if uh, any of the listeners can actually fit within that box. And then if they yeah. can, what other options are there out there? Definitely. So, you know, it's always good to see if you can go traditional. Obviously, if a property's way too beat up, you know, the condition does play a factor in it. So sometimes you're not going to be able to buy, you know, there's certain properties that are only cash or, you know, creative types of financing yeah. just because of the condition. But, you know, on some, on light fix and flips, you know, different properties like that, it's always good to start with traditional financing to see if you can qualify because obviously you're going to get the best rate, the best terms right now because of what's going on with coronavirus non non QM or non conforming mortgages have really dried up. You know, there's not as many lenders. It really, really hit me and it was crazy. 
because I had a client that I was working with in, in Los Angeles trying to get them a refinance and I had to broker it out to a non-QM lender, which was a bank in LA. And this was like three weeks ago when this whole thing barely started kind of, you know, unfolding. And I'm talking to this guy from the bank and I'd been working this deal with him for a couple months. And then all of a sudden he calls me three weeks ago and he says, you know, we're one week out from closing. And he tells me, hey, Larry, you know, I got bad news. None of the loans that we have are going to fund. The bank just folded. All of us got laid off and like the bank's done. And I'm just like, whoa, that's when it really, that's when the coronavirus thing really hit me. And I was like, dang, man, you know, banks are starting to close. You know, these things are starting to happen. So to begin with, a lot of that financing has dried up and a lot of hard money lenders have really, you know, gotten stricter on their their terms are. Some of them that were lending 80 to 90%, you know, LTV are now down to 70%. You know, they're really drying up the financing and or bringing up the rates. But thankfully, you know, with what I do, most of the loans that we do are government loans, Fannie, Freddie loans that are conforming loans. And that sort of financing is still, you know, awesome and good to go right now. Historically, some of the lowest interest rates you've ever seen. But a little bit more difficult to qualify, but there's three main things that we look for as a mortgage lender when approving somebody for a home loan, right? Before we get into the three, you mentioned in the very beginning of the conversation that, you know, it needs to be fundable, right? It needs to be financeable. So let's talk about some examples, I guess, of what wouldn't be. So like if there's no roof, right? Yeah, (laughs) if there's no roof, you're probably not going to be able to finance it. If it has a crazy, you know, crack slab or something that's, you know, that's detrimental to the structure, you know, pretty intense, you're probably not going to be able to finance it. There are some pretty cool loans. There's actually an FHA loan that allows you to, to, as a one-time use as your first property that you buy, to buy something that's a fix and flip, like, you know, that that needs work. And and they actually will lend you the the renovation cost for that as well. It's the FHA 203. uh, Yeah, Yeah. correct. 203K, FHA 203K. So that allows you to purchase the property and borrow the financing for renovations for a property that's distressed, right? But yeah, it has to have a roof, has to, you know, structurally be like, you know. The kitchen should be there, right? Yeah, kitchen should be there. <laughs> yeah. Has to be, you know, in at least, you know, decent, decent. Obviously, you know, it can need work and things like that, but it's got to be overall, you know, at least there in an existing home and stuff like that, right? Yeah, so it can be outdated. Like it needs to be functional exactly. to be able to be get the financing. Yeah, livable. Yep. Exactly. That's mm-hmm. good. Okay, so let's dive into the three then. Yeah, so there's three things that a mortgage lender typically is going to look for when approving you for a home loan, right? The first one is your FICO score, your credit score, right? As you know, you're the credit master. So you're working on people's credit, you know, and it, as most people know, you know, there's three reporting bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. When you're applying for a mortgage loan, we have to do a, a hard pull, which gives us a, the exact number from all three bureaus. And we don't take the highest and we don't take the lowest. We have to take the middle score. Okay. Sure. So some people, you know, and there, there can be a little bit of variance, usually Credit Karma or these sorts of apps give you a decent estimate based on, you know, whatever your information that's logged into their system is, they give you a decent estimate as to where you should be, or they might be showing you one of those bureaus reporting, but there can be a little bit of variance. So I always like to give people a heads up, you know, I've seen as big as a hundred points, but typically they're within 50 points of whatever your actual FICO score is, right? But th- those are usually good indicators to be able to at least give you a close estimate, right? Yeah. So, so the basically first, the ones that you're getting it for free, those are Vantage scores. So they can be very far off. The The furthest I've ever seen off is like 150 points and that could be yeah. either up or down. So exactly. it's, very, it's, it's very loose, but if you understand the six boxes, then you should know roughly like how the six boxes that make up your FICO, mm-hmm. you should be able to understand closer to right around where that FICO score is. Otherwise, you guys could always reach out to the three bureaus and get your free report once a year and get your FICO. Um, exactly. Should help. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. The you know, FICO score, they've really tightened up the regulations recently because of what's going on. So like three weeks ago, I could do uh, you know, a government loan like an FHA loan with three and a half percent down or VA loan with a FICO score as low as 580. Yeah. Most brokers are now like, I just saw an article the other day that Chase Bank now won't even, isn't even really looking at most people that have less than like 700 and less than like 20% down. So most brokers are at like 640 to 660 to qualify for government loan. At Cardinal, we're a direct lender. So usually the terms are better. So we can do still as low as 620, but that's still, you know, quite a bit higher than the 580 that it was a few weeks ago. And they're really tightening up, you know, the, as far as for a government loan, you're going to want to make sure that you don't have 
you know, any accounts in dispute, that you don't have any recent derogatory on the credit. You know, they're going to really criticize the last 12 months, mostly, you know, if there's any 30, 60, 90 day late, things like that in the last year. There's certain things that don't matter as much, like, you know, old medical collections, things like that are not as as frowned upon, like they won't, they, you know, they, they don't consider those as much, but, you know, recent collections, recent judgments, things like that. Usually if it's older than four years, then they're, they're not sweating it too much, but exactly. uh, anything recent is going to be something not in your favor. You definitely want to change that around. So if you guys yeah. need credit repair, reach out and we can teach you how to do it, or we can do it for you and be exactly. able to help you get to that next level. Also, I do want to give a little tip when it comes down to shopping around for rates. Mm -hmm. because a lot of people do this and if you're shopping around strictly for rates with mortgages you're gonna find yourself getting a ton I'm talking like a ton of hard inquiries I had one one of my clients he ended up getting 58 hard inquiries wow (laughs) so we were able to remove 56 of them for him but wow but understand the aspect of really it doesn't matter about the rate the rate changes about a dozen times or more per day. Now, mm-hmm. the origination fee is really what you want to ask. That's the mm-hmm. that's the question that you want to bring up to the lenders, correct? Correct. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's always like, hey, what's the rate? What's the rate? Everybody's so like focused on the rate. And it's like, man, I can quote you a rate right now, but by the time that I get your information, we run your credit and I'm ready to actually lock this rate, it might be completely different, especially right now, like you're saying, there's repricing multiple times throughout the day because of how volatile the market is right now. Yeah. So a rate that I quote somebody, you know, one day is completely different the next day or even later that day, right? So some people are just so driven by the rate. And as you said, you know, it's it's important to understand that like make sure that you're happy more than anything with the lender, the lender fees, like the origination and those things. And most of the time, the lenders are going to be pretty close as far as the rates, as long as they're competitive, you know, but of course, you know, looking into the origination and if there's discount points being added to it, you know, typically I don't really recommend people pay discount points, but right now, just because of how historically low the rates are, I think it's a really good time to take advantage. Like I have some clients that are paying like half a point, you know, rate costs or in discount points to be able to lock in a 2.75 or 2.875 30 year fixed yeah. uh, loan, you know, conventional. So it's like, man, that's an awesome, awesome rate, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, paying so. almost nothing for it, right? Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so. In, in those certain circumstances, it, it could be beneficial to use the buy down points. Mm-hmm. Usually from my personal experience and Mm -hmm. I haven't done like a million of these, but from what I've seen, I've noticed that it typically isn't, but always Mm -hmm. look towards the education that your mortgage, what would it be called? Mortgage. Mortgage lender. Yeah, I guess just mortgage lender, like the main person yeah. that's on your account. Yeah, the mortgage loan originator or the mortgage. Yeah, the mortgage loan originator. Yes. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Make sure yeah, you're just getting low. the education from from that person to be able to guide you in the right path. Every time basically if, if I was going to shop around, you want to look for the origination fee to see how much that would be. And then sometimes the cheapest isn't always the best, right? So exactly. you want to you wanna make sure that they can perform, that they're mm-hmm. organized and that they overall can, like you can really see yourself working with this person to guide you towards your end goal of mm-hmm. getting the property or, or just closing on the loan, right? So those are the two things that I would recommend and stop giving all your info to somebody and you know getting them to do, like to actually give you a serious quote. They're going to pull your credit and mm-hmm. it's going to be a hard inquiry and it's going to mess up your credit if you get a bunch of these mm-hmm. and, and if you're just shopping around. So before you do that, just make sure you feel comfortable with that person, that they can guide you to your end goal and, and just ask for the origination fee. Stop mm-hmm. asking about the rates. I see so many people do that. It's exactly. So yeah, no, that's key. And like you said, making sure that they can perform because right now there's just so many lenders, like there's so many different ways that a loan can, can go wrong. And, I've, and I see so many times that, you know, lenders will over promise or, you know, directly from the beginning, knowing very little information or without pulling credit, yep. you know, we'll send a quote and, you know, all these different things. And it's like, man, you really 
like a lot of times I tell my clients, you know, it might be a little bit more tedious in the beginning and I'm going to ask you a lot more questions in the beginning, but it's because by the time that we're done with our initial call, I'm going to structure something that I know we can perform on and I've done my due diligence and ran your credit. And by the, by the time I give somebody a pre-approval, we've already passed DU, which is the desktop underwriting for yep. uh, Freddie and Fannie Mae that buy these loans. So, you know, by that time, we're very, very confident that we can perform. We have a DU approval. We've ran debt to income ratios and all those things and it looks good. And a lot of lenders sometimes won't, you know, take that whole step and we'll just kind of throw a quote on in the beginning. And then later on, you know, oh, sorry, actually the rate, you know, went up because of this or, you know, we weren't able to perform because of this when, you know, there's things that you can cash from the very beginning if you're doing your due diligence, right? Sure. Now, do you guys have underwriters in-house or is this a... We do. So the cool thing about being a direct lender with Cardinal is, yeah, we have everything in house. Our processors and underwriters are all in house. So like every, literally every morning at 7 a.m. we have like a pipeline call and that uh, we go through all the loans and everybody from like it's just a quick call from the COO to all the lenders and uh, processors and underwriters just to everybody be on the same page. So to make sure that, you know, nothing's getting skipped. We're not, you know, because it can be easy to obviously let, you know, a couple things go in, in a loan. So just to make sure that, you know, we're not missing a beat and that everything is getting taken care of, you know, because funding and performing on time is, is the biggest thing, obviously, for us most of the time when it comes to purchases and stuff. These people yeah. have deadlines. They need, you know, they're planning to be, you know, moving out of their home and into another one. And the worst thing that you could do is like fail somebody in that at that time, right? Yeah, I hope all the listeners really identify like how much gold that really is. That's something special to have in-house underwriting and have that morning call every day just to make mm -hmm. sure that no loans are left behind, right? Exactly. You know, that's yeah. so, so crucial because having the relationship with the underwriting, they have the final say in it. Mm -hmm. They're the ones, you know, making the, the certain little tweaks. So I've run into the same situation in the past that the person helping me and working on it, the originator, mm -hmm. promising the world. And yeah, I've already okay. talked to other lenders knowing that I don't think that they can help me, but <laughs> of course we can. But, yeah. you know, they're just trying to push me on to, you know, get their job done and go on to the next. You don't want somebody like that. Mm -hmm. You want somebody that sits down with you, takes the time in the beginning, can answer all questions and really be able to make sure that they're fully equipped with your situation so that they can help mold you and fit you into their box right mm -hmm. yeah and especially at a time like right now you know it's tough because yeah. most lenders are, are really saturated with yeah. business right now and like for us we're doing you know at least two like two to two and a half times the amount of loans that we normally do right now with what's going on and, and we haven't been able to like hire more people so like you know normally a processor might have you know 30 loans and our processor right now is working with like 75 files which is way too much so it's like now you know working on creating those systems and that's between several lenders obviously not just yeah me, but you know working to implement the systems to make sure that things still get done but you know a lot of a lot of lenders are pretty overwhelmed right now and oversaturated so it's important to make sure that you know you're going with somebody that has you know control over the process that you know and that's the thing i like like our the pod that works together on our loans has actually been working together for nine years so they yeah. you know super that's familiar so with everybody you know pumping out the loans you know much quicker so you know we've still been able to get our refis done in 30 days, which a lot of lenders we've seen take 60 to 90 days, you know, later and having to extend rate locks and things like that just because of, you know, how many loans there are happening right now. Yeah. So why do you think it is that business is just starting to really explode? Yeah. Well, I think it's for many reasons. A lot of people saw the whole 0% Fed rate and people were like hitting me up like, Hey, can I get a 0% mortgage? Yeah. So, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of marketing just from the media and everything kind of pumping out and showing that, you know, the Fed rate is at an all time low. The 10 year treasury bonds hit an all time low. You know, typically the mortgage 30 year fixed rate mortgages follow those trends. And we saw the rates get lower than they have, you know, in a long, 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 long time ever, you know, like in February, March, I think is when they hit the all time low. And we slowly start to see them creep up a little bit from then, but hold very, very level at like in the low three still and, you know, still yeah. solid great rates, but haven't been following, you know, uh, according to where the Fed rate and the 10 year treasuries are at, they should have been lower, right? So not necessarily following that, but because, you know, a lot of lenders also got scared and pulled back when, 
Donald Trump announced no evictions, no foreclosures. So a lot of money financing dried up a little bit. Tightened up, right? Yeah. Lenders get scared a little bit. But then the government announced that they'd be buying back a lot of these, you know, mortgage, mortgage backed securities and everything like that. So that gave confidence and now the rates are, are good. And, you know, we're still pumping out a lot of loans, thankfully. And it's a good time to look into refinancing or, you know, taking advantage of an opportunity like that right now. Yeah. I know like you're not a, a market analyzer or anything, but what, what are your predictions? What, what are you hearing in the grapevine? Do you think rates will go lower or what do you think the future kind of holds for everybody? Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball and to yeah. do my best, you know, just to do my best as far as like what I think. We have the elections coming up, you know, so that's always something that typically right before an election, the interest rates hold pretty, pretty well, pretty low. You know, Donald Trump is doing everything to try to get reelected. So I think that he's going to do everything to try to make sure that money is still inexpensive, especially because of what's going on right now. You know, we've seen these loans like these EIDL loans, these PPP, paycheck protection plan loans, and a lot of, you know, money being printed pump. out of thin air and just pumped into the yeah. air. It's a little scary on one end. It's like, yeah, I don't know, you know, where does that, you know, kind of put us as far as inflation and things like that go. But uh, on the other <laughs> end, I think- Worse than it was. <laughs> exactly, right? And it was already really bad, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, it's already really bad. It's probably just gonna get worse. So that's, that is scary. It's something that I've been thinking about lately. But as far as mortgage loans and stuff like that, I, I mean, it would make sense. And I think that they're gonna still hold pretty low and pretty steady, at least until we see the elections, you know? Yeah. After that, I think they're probably gonna start to creep back up again and, you know, we'll see. But for now, they've been, they've been holding strong, you know, and low threes and stuff on good credit. So still historically solid, solid rates, a lot of refinances right now. Yeah, I love it. I think mm -hmm. God's working for me right now because he knows I got a big refi coming up. So exactly. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You're God willing, man. So yeah. <laughs> that's just a crazy time right now. You know, there's, um, it's unfortunate because of all the uncertainty and, you know, people that are losing their jobs, but it's also, I think, going to create more opportunity than possibly ever for, it for will. Us that are in real estate and people, yeah. people that are in wholesaling and fix and flips and these sorts of things. I think that now more than ever, there's going to be people that get themselves in situations that are going to need to be helped out of those situations by a wholesaler, or an investor, different things like that. So there's a good opportunity to, to make money and help people because it truly is like, a, at least in the deals I've done, you know, you, some people see it as like, Oh, taking advantage. But in reality, you know, you see these people get in these situations where, if it weren't for an investor or a wholesaler interfering to get these people money and moved on, they could have just lost the house and walked away with no money or it could have ended up being much worse, you know? So you know, we have an opportunity to really help people because in times like this of uncertainty, a lot of people just don't know what to do or aren't yeah. sure what their options are. Right. So. Yeah. There, I mean, if you've never been the type of person that sees the opportunity right in front of you, it's going to smack you in the face very soon because exactly. there's going to be a, an abundance of it. And there's going to be, you know, good and bad from that, but make sure you're on the right side. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on Larry, because I know you, you can give the motivation, you can give the education of understanding what the traditional mortgage looks like and also be able to help prepare people to get on the right side, right? So, mm -hmm. so that they can reach out to you. Sorry, let's break down the three one more time. I know you already yeah, covered sure. it, but what yeah, are yeah. they just bullet points? So the first one is your FICO score right now. You got to be at least above a 620 to qualify. Some lenders are higher, but for us, it's 620 right now. Okay. Uh, the second thing that a lender is going to look for is your last two years, your history of your income. So whether that be that you're a W-2 paid employee that gets paid hourly or salary, or let's say you're an investor and you're self-employed, you know, the lender is going to want to see that you have a last two years, you have a history of making that income. You know, a couple of things that some people, you know, do that put them like for example myself actually one thing that can kind of turn around to bite you in the butt is I was managing a nutritional supplement store and I was in that field for like 10 years right in mm -hmm. sub nutritional supplement stores and I was paid w2 and I quit that job to get into pursue real estate full-time and then to get into mortgage lending so even though Cardinal pays me W-2 since I went from one industry to a completely different industry. Sometimes that can cancel out the income that you've had over the last two years and they're going to want to, the lender's going to want to see that you have a two-year history in at least something that's similar, right? And then if you're an investor or you have self-employment income, 1099, things like that, then they're going to want to see that the last two years, you know, you've filed your taxes and they're going to look at your self-employment income. The way that they calculate self-employment income is a little trickier than W-2 income. 
So we can't go based off of your gross receipts or your total sales as a self-employed person. We have to go based off of the net profit, which is after you've expensed everything to make it look like you're broke on paper so that you don't have to pay too much in taxes. <laughs> so that's a number that we have to unfortunately go based off of. There's a couple little tricks and things that you can do to add income into that. Depreciation can be added back into net profit. And, you know, a lot of times people will have depreciation in their business and that can be added back into uh, the net profit. But essentially we have to go based off the net profit divided by 12 months. And that would be your monthly income that we're allowed to use, right? For a W-2 employee, it's a lot easier because you go based off of their salary or a 40-hour work week for the last two years. And that's, that's a little bit about how the income is calculated. But if you were, say, a W-2 employee and then you went into you know, being self-employed, then you'd have to now create a full two, new two-year history of having that sort of income, right? So the W-2, they're basically just adding up the last two years and then they're going to divide it by it to see what the actual monthly revenue yeah, so is. So the way it works exactly is like, let's say it depends if your salary, then you use the whole salary, right? If you're hourly, then let's say you make 15 bucks an hour, but let's say you make overtime and bonuses or something like that. I have to go based off 15 times 40 hours a week and making sure that you always work 40 hours a week. That's one thing that they're going to ask you. And then multiplying it by 52 weeks in the year and then dividing it by 12 would give me their base pay. If I wanted to use overtime or bonuses, I'd have to show that the last two years there's been a consistency of that bonus and overtime. Hmm. Normally, if you have you know, a bonus and overtime and that sort of thing, they're going to have to order what's called a verification of employment and BOE to be able to to get the exact numbers, but that's where the lender is going to contact your employer, ask them to fill out a worksheet that essentially it's kind of like on your pay stubs. One thing I like to ask for is if you have the last pay stub of the year, that really helps me see all the income broken down because the W-2 will lump all your income together, but the last pay stub of the year will show me your year to date for base pay, overtime, you know, bonus and commissions. Yeah. And if I have the last pay stub of the last two years, then I, I can input that and then it'll take an average of the last two years is how it's yeah. calculated. So overall, traditional lenders want to see you working in the same industry for the last mm -hmm. two years, no changes. And if there are changes, you can't be jumping into like being a teacher one year and then the mm -hmm. next year you're, I don't know, a mechanic, you know? Exactly. You, you want to be in the same industry if you're a pharmacist and you switch to a different company with pharmacy, then that could be doable but they want to see the same. If you're an entrepreneur, then, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too type of thing. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you can't have all the write-offs if you mm -hmm. want to get the traditional lending. And I've screwed myself over several years by doing that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and this year we're really setting it up so that I can get some funding back. <laughs> nice. Get some, good, good. get some more lending. But we've done pretty good to take care of as many as we could for the yeah. traditional because there is a cap right around mm -hmm. that. 10 is technically the cap, but some lenders, once they start seeing you creep up there, it starts getting a little bit more difficult for the traditional, correct? Exactly. Yeah, you're right. 10 is usually the cutoff, but yeah, depending on how over leveraged you are, they can start getting a little stricter before that. Yeah. And yeah, the third thing that we look for, just to make sure that we recap that, is the debt to income ratio. So if people are unfamiliar with how that's calculated, basically it's a percentage yeah. that we calculate. And the, the way that we calculate that is if you're W-2, you know, pretty easy. We take your gross monthly income. So before taxes, you know, if it's that W-2 income divided by 12, you know, before you pay taxes, and then whatever your future mortgage payment is going to be. So to make the numbers really easy, let's say that you're looking for a house where your payment, you know, might be around 2,500 bucks a month. Let's say that you make $5,000 a month, you know, gross monthly income. Then there's two debt to income ratios. There's what's called the front ratio and the back ratio. Mm -hmm. The front ratio is that 2,500 divided by 5,000, which would give you 50%. Yeah. And that's basically the percentage of your gross monthly income that is being consumed by the mortgage payment. Sure. Right. The back ratio is the mortgage payment plus any of your current debt obligations, car payments, student loans, medical bills, even if they're in deferment, unless they're forgiven, they're still counted. And credit cards you know, as credit well. Cards, credit cards. Exactly. Yep. Credit card payments, things like that. All the monthly payments for those things are added to the mortgage payment. And then let's say that that was 5,000 total and I divided it by your monthly income, which is 5,000. That would give me 100%. That means 100% of your monthly income is being consumed by the debts. Of course, you're not going to qualify, right? There's strict caps that we have to abide by because they're government loans. So for an FHA loan where you put three and a half percent down, typically you can go up to 56.99% on that back ratio. 
46 point nine nine percent on that's the high yeah that's that's yeah. pretty high isn't it that's pretty pretty high some lenders are going to be a little bit more strict on that for cardinal you know for us we're able to go to 56.99 the highest is yeah is typically a va vas I, we can go up to 59 I, although i've seen vas get approved at like 65 even up to 70 percent which is shocking yeah shocked me but i've seen i've seen it happen <laughs> I've, I've actually that's, never heard more than 55 percent but i i haven't been looking around for a while now so that yeah. makes sense yeah, sense. so it just depends. You know, there's when we take a full 1003 loan application, we have to submit it to DU, which is the desktop underwriting, which is like the automated approval that Fannie or Freddie, you know, give us. And as long as it passes that, you know, yeah. it likes the assets, the credit, you know, yep. you know, those sorts of things, then it'll allow some people to go to a little bit of a higher ratio. We also work with down payment assistance programs. Those ratios are typically lower, though. Usually you got to be capped at like 45% on something like that. So it limits your purchasing power. Talk to me about that. I, I haven't heard about that. What is that exactly? So down payment assistance is awesome. Unfortunately, right now, the, those programs, mostly a lot of them are dried up or, or like on pause right now. Yeah. But most of them, like we do a lot of loans in California. It's called CalHAFA, so C-A-L and then H-F-A. And these are loans for first-time home buyers that allow you to borrow the down payment. So those are some really cool options as well. You know, if you qualify and you're somebody that's getting into real estate investing, but maybe you've been working a job and you can qualify for a traditional financing loan, then there's some really awesome opportunities to take advantage of there because you can borrow anywhere between three to 5% of the purchase price. So sure. the, the entire down payment and plus another one and a half percent to cover your closing costs, right? So, you know, a lot of times maybe on a half a million dollar home where your total, you know, cash in might have been closer to like 30,000, maybe you can come in, you know, closer to like 10 to 15. And then if you're able to get a seller credit, then you can limit your closing costs, your cash to close even more. So that can really limit your out-of-pocket expense quite a bit if you if you can qualify. Wow. But yeah, they have stricter ratios to make sure that the affordability is there because they obviously don't want to put you in a position where, you know, you're going to overextend yourself and the affordability is not there, right? Yeah. And usually it's basically going to be right around that 45% to 55 if you're mm -hmm. going to be like owner-occupied meaning mm -hmm. living there. As an investor, you typically get bullied a little bit more and exactly. <laughs> you get slightly higher interest rates. And mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's multifamily, then they really mm -hmm. like to tax on. But then your debt to income needs to be lower as well. Uh, yeah. 40 to 45 range is kind of max. But that's a great place to start. You know, for a lot of people that are like, if you haven't bought your first place or you're looking to get your first one, I know like my house, you know, the first one that I bought, it's like I, you know, I saved up enough money to at least be able to put a three and a half percent down payment. Yeah. And like my real estate professor always said, he's like, you want to buy the house from the little old lady in Pasadena. He would say, he'd be like, you know, just an older lady that has, has had the home forever. So there's tons of equity and, you know, you can get a good deal. And so I was like, okay, I got, there's gotta be somebody. And I was working at the supplement shop every day and I'm like, somebody here has got to be selling their house, right? Right. So I finally found this, you know, lady who was, who was awesome and her and her husband were an older couple and they were looking to move like a year from then. And, but I always helped them out with their health and supplement type stuff I had like hip replacements and all kinds of stuff. So I would do my best to help them out with those things and built a relationship with them over a year till they were finally like, Hey Larry, we're actually going to be moving. You know, if you want to come take a look at the house and you know, they didn't, they're older, they didn't want to deal with real estate agents and showings and repairs. And they had a crazy taste. So their some walls were pink and the lawn room was highlighter yellow with purple cabinets and just like it, you know the paint was less like she'd have to do some work to get it up to par so for them it worked out because they got you know they got the amount of money they were happy with to be able to go buy another house and retire in Arizona yeah I got a good deal on it and they were okay taking less money because they didn't want to deal with all those headaches and stuff like that so you know if you have the opportunity to qualify for something it's awesome to be able to qualify that house I bought for 432,000 I put three and a half percent down I held it for two years as a primary residence I bought it as primary residence even though I was renting it to a friend of mine for cash yeah. and I was losing a hundred bucks a month on it and some people are like dude you're an idiot why are you losing money on this and I was like dude it's cool you know it's a long, long term anyway so I'm losing a hundred bucks a month for two years then I had to borrow some money from my best friend who at the time I you know I had that was my first investment I was like I didn't have much a ton of money 
And so uh, I had to borrow about 20000 from him to, to be able to fix up the house and then ended up selling it. And we ended up selling it for 600000 So I held it for like two years. And that was like a hundred and change profit that I was able to use and put into like the next projects, you know? So Let's it's like, go, oh, baby, that like, even if you're like, yeah, anybody can do that, right? Like, even if you're not even like super into investing or you're kind of scared or you're going to get like your first one, if you qualify traditional. Yeah. And you can get into a property where you're putting three and a half percent down. And if you run your numbers and your mortgage payment is being covered, I was even willing to lose a hundred bucks a month, you know, but if you can find a scenario where you're breaking even, then I'd say it's a no brainer. You know, it's so little, it's such a little investment overall for long term that, you know, if you're cash flowing, somebody else is paying your mortgage, you can expense the interest paid and the property taxes from your income, you know, and then you can sell it after the two years. And since I sold it after two years and it was my primary residence, there was nothing paid in taxes. Yeah. I love that. So, <laughs> so it comes down to the strategy, obviously, because sticking with it for two years, so you're not paying because there, there's a certain law that allows you to not have to pay capital gain taxes if you mm -hmm. hang on to it for two years, which is awesome. And then, you know, understanding your market, making sure that it is going to appreciate in your mm -hmm. area exactly. and, and knowing your location, you know, so all those things kind of have a little factor into it, but I love that. I mean, what for two years, a hundred bucks minus every, every month, exactly. 2,400 bucks. And then you're walking yeah. up on an additional over a hundred K in profits from the mm -hmm. equity that you, you build up. I mean, you got into the deal for 3.5. Yeah. I mean, that's not bad at all. That's, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So it's a good, I think it's a good option for a lot of people at least to be able to get started and then, yeah. you know, be able to cash something out. I think, I think, yeah, like you said, it has a lot to do with the market you're in. I think San Diego, you know, I, I really like this market just because of, you know, our economy is made up of so much military and technology and biotechnology and, yep. you know, all these things that I think are going to continue to prop up, you know, the, the home values here in San Diego, but you know, over other areas, I think. So I, you know, I, that's why I think, you know, I prefer to invest here. Plus, I don't know, I like to be able to see the property. And it's our backyard. I mean, come exactly. on. It's, it's nice. our backyard, you know, yeah. so it's, yeah, it's pretty nice. It's Beautiful pretty spot to go check out some properties. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I love that. So as we're wrapping up everything, you got one other thing uh, that you do on a regular basis that, that really makes an impact, right? You got a for purpose business for anybody out there that doesn't know what a for purpose business is. Do you mind just giving the breakdown? Yeah, for sure. So for purpose business, I, I had I got to give some props to one of my mentors, Cole Hatter from Thrive, because when I joined his mastermind about three years ago, that's where, uh, you know, going to his event was where I first started to learn about this whole thing called what he called a for purpose business. And he had this pretty cool model that was like, you know, at the time I was barely getting into this whole entrepreneur space and trying to see like who I wanted to, you know, emulate or follow or whose content I really wanted to, you know, start absorbing. And I, and I liked Cole just because, you know, because of his family values, his core values, and just the, the whole thing about giving back and everything. He actually has an orphanage down in Mexico. Like my family has shelters down in, in Mexico as well for kids that have been rescued from human trafficking. So that really hit home for me. And I was like, man, this is cool. Like, it's not all about like Lambos and this and that. It's like, hey, like, let's, you know, we're all here because we want to make money. But what are you really doing to make an impact in the world, you know, is, right. is what matters more in, in that group, you know, and in that culture, which was, was really awesome. So the whole four purpose business model basically and like he likes to say you know it's like if you want to make a million dollars why not go out and make two million and give a million away and then keep a million for yourself right so like the whole principle behind the for purpose business model is kind of tying together nonprofit with business right my family went off and started a nonprofit about 10 years ago we found out very quickly that nonprofits are very non-profitable <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know so I kind of always saw my like role in that as like I, you know I was younger so I was like man I really want to grow up and be able to make money or, or be able to build a network so that we don't have to worry about you know we struggled so much with fundraising in the beginning and all these different things and I'm like man if God put this on our heart you know I'm sure that he's gonna provide and, and everything right. but it was a challenge kind of getting financing in the beginning and a lot of people don't want to get involved in human trafficking and things like that you know so the for purpose business model I like because I'm like, man, if I could put together, you know, an awesome thing that I want to do like this nonprofit thing with business and be able to, you know, expand that to be able to, to really be able to increase the impact that I can actually make in the world then that would be awesome, right? So it's, it's like for Tom's would be a good example of a for purpose business where you buy, you know, one pair of shoes and they give the other pair of shoes away. So maybe they can, you know, bake the cost of that additional pair of shoes into that pair that you purchased. And yeah. by you buying that pair of shoes, somebody else got to benefit from that. So that's an example of one 
you know, like a one for one for a purpose business model. Another, you know, it, it can also just be as simple as like for me and my businesses, I just do like, you know, a percentage of my profits every single year just goes directly to INH and to the nonprofit organization to help, you know, increase awareness about human trafficking and the services for the kids. So it can be as easy as just partnering with a nonprofit organization that does good work that you trust in whatever it is, whether you're passionate about you know, animals or kids or any, anything that it is, I think it's just, you know, you don't have to necessarily go out and do that work too. You can find, you know, there's plenty of awesome humans out there that are doing incredible work that you can partner up with. And, you know, you being able to give them a financial donation really goes a long way for nonprofits, you know, and, and allows us to be able to do what we do and provide the services we do for the kids down in La Casa de Jardín is what we call it, which is the garden house for the kids down in Mexico, right? So, you know, there's tons of different ways to get involved, even just using, you know, your platform or your network to increase awareness. People host toy drives for us during Christmas or canned food drives. You know, I've been lucky enough to connect with a lot of awesome entrepreneurs through Thrive and different events I go to. And we do, we take trips down because the homes are just about 20, 30 minutes across the border. So we'll take day trips down where we get to play with the kids and celebrate birthdays for them. For a lot of them, it's the first time they've ever had a birthday celebrated or they've ever celebrated a holiday like as a family. So, you know, some people can donate their time. Some people can donate with money or, you know, but there's so many different ways to do that in business. And I think that it, when you tie it directly into your business model, it sets a standard in your culture that like it's, it's what you're about yeah. and people really are passionate about that and want to get behind it. It's like, you know, about, I remember one of my first jobs was at Chick-fil-A and I worked there for several years and my brother stuck with it and he's actually on pace to hopefully becoming an operator for, for a Chick-fil-A career pretty soon, hopefully. And one of the things they always talked about that I loved was like, hey, we're here, to, you want to create raving fans, right? And how do you do that? By like going, they would talk about like second mile service, like go, you know, go the second mile and really go above people's expectations. And that's how you're going to create these raving fans and we'd have and we would create raving fans and you see you see the culture that Chick-fil-A has created and people people freaking love Chick-fil-A right yeah yeah so it's like about like setting that kind of standard in your business and being able to show people what you're about and the fact that you know if you're the one business that's that's doing something like that and it's different you're making an impact I think it's that allows people to really get behind you as a, as a business. Otherwise, like, you know, you're selling a product or service, but it doesn't really become special until it hits home for someone. Yeah. It's not making a huge impact. It, it's mm -hmm. more, you know, it's helping the consumer and it's helping you, the, the seller. Mm -hmm. But besides that, the for purpose businesses are really going to, you're going to see more and more of it pop up in the near future. Like everybody leans towards that way because mm -hmm. if, if I can buy the same pair of sneakers here, that I can over here, but this person, when I pay the same amount of money over here, they're actually going to give another pair of shoes to somebody that really needs it, then mm -hmm. who wouldn't go this route, you know? So exactly. there's dozens upon dozens, probably hundreds of, you know, for purpose businesses that are highly favorable. I think even Stella does. Yeah, uh, Stella, Stella, I think partners with, a, I don't know if they're partnered with water.org or they do something, but they, they make like the like something really water nice classes too and yeah. do all kinds of stuff for nonprofits. So yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of them popping up now more than ever, thankfully, you know? Yeah. And I think hopefully like what Cole always says is like, man, I'd love to see the day where like, if you're not a for purpose business, you're going to get like taken out of the market, you know, because it's like everybody's going to be doing something to give back. And that's just going to be ingrained in a lot of these businesses, you know, and I think that it'd be awesome to see a day where that happens. And I think that we, you know, if, if that did happen, we, we would, I mean, start to see a lot more problems being solved, a lot more people yes. being helped. And I think that it would make it a huge, tremendous impact in the world for sure. Yeah. So I just want to tell you guys a quick little story, you know, back, I wish it was longer, but it, it's probably just been about like three years, two to three years. There's been a shift in my life when it comes down to giving. And for the longest time, you know, I grew up poor. I grew up a section eight housing, single parent mom that only got funds mm -hmm. off of social security. So, you know, not like third, third world country poor, but like mm -hmm. American poor, which is still really, really good yeah. to see, you know, <laughs> But as far as giving, I was always very selfish. I was always like, I, I need to make money for me and I'm going to hoarder it. And mm -hmm. I always put money on a pedestal. And overall, I revealed in church that like I was stingy and I, I was hanging on to it. And there's been an unlock for me of giving uh, just, you know, the last couple of years. And I guess the moral behind this is 
whenever you need something really coming from the right place and not allow anything like money to be able to control your life, to like have some burden over you and and totally just let go and live in abundance. I've always noticed if you're down to your last five bucks and you need 20, you know, give the $5 and then just watch and see how, how it comes Mm -hmm. back to you. It's even biblical in Mm -hmm. in the aspect that it, it tells you that, you know, when you give with an open heart and really give an abundance with no lack, that heaven's gates will open up upon you and just flood you in your life in all different areas. So I'm really praying for, for the same shift to happen to you right now while you guys are listening. You know, Larry's a type of awesome guy that, you know, he's a real estate investor. He's doing all these different things, but his heart is in the right place when it comes down to giving and making a bigger impact on the world. So I love the idea of for purpose businesses. Jennifer and I have actually wanted to start up one for years now and just mm. lacking on that. So no, no excuses with that. We will work on that in the near future, but, yeah. but I want to challenge you guys right now and partner up with Larry because what you guys have created it is something that is really changing a lot of people's lives right now. And it's the International Network of Hearts. That's I-N-H, right? That's what it stands for. Okay. Yep, yep. International Network of Hearts. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You're repping the shirt. That's what's oh, yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> so just like we were talking about a few minutes ago, guys, when it comes down to recognizing opportunities and, you know, very soon there's going to be a ridiculous amount of opportunities right in front of us. You know, at a blink of an eye, there's going to be opportunities and how to be able to recognize that and making sure that you're on the right side. Now, I know the world's crazy right now. I know there's a lot of chaos going on out there, but there's got to be a, a turning point of like faith and canceling out any fear and really living in abundance and realizing that there are ridiculous amounts of opportunity yesterday, today, and tomorrow. How can we actually get a hold of you to be able to um, donate and, and support in however, you know, what kind of ways would be needed? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, man. So our website is www.inhearts. So like I-N-H and then it's inhearts.org. So yeah, we can post a link here, I believe, or in the comments, but it's yeah. Yeah, www.inhearts.org. And you can click donate now at the top right of the page. And there's a place that you can subscribe for like a monthly donation, even like for five or 10 bucks a month, I think is a little like a Starbucks cup of coffee or something like yeah. that a month, you know, yeah. and, and those recurring donations go a long way for us. Or you can make a one-time donation on the page. There's also a, a page where you can see kind of like a constant needs list. So if you're local to San Diego or you wanted to donate more like items, you know, as you can imagine, we have about 20 three kids right now. So, you know, and we're going through the same toilet paper crisis too. <laughs> yeah. no, so we have like, you know, a ton of kids. So, you know, all the hygienic supplies, we always go through toilet paper, you know, paper towels, cleaning supplies, canned foods, things like that. You know, we're definitely blessed right now that, that God is still continuing to provide for us right now, even during these difficult times. And, um, you know, we have kids are anywhere from our youngest is 18 months to 24 years old. And we've been able to kind of centralize them to one home now. And we have an awesome staff staff that's still continuing to to work really, really hard and taking care of the kids and everything. And they're quarantined up themselves. Yeah. Uh, but we get to have like a church service on Sundays that we're actually opening up to the public as well. It's like on a Zoom Zoom thing. You can't see the kids' faces or anything because their identities are all protected. But we do like on sun, uh, Sunday service with them, which is awesome. If anybody wants to join, it's on the International Network of Hearts Facebook page. And then, yeah, that's where you can pretty much get, uh, get information, get involved, sign up for our newsletter to, to keep in touch. So the International Network of Hearts, it's a nonprofit for human trafficking, correct? Correct. So we spread awareness and prevention uh, of human trafficking. And then we have two shelters down in Mexico, just across the border uh, for victims that have been recovered. And, you know, we, we have provide housing for them, obviously, food, shelter, all the essentials. And we have psych, they have therapy appointments once a week, like they have one on one, you know, yeah. uh, psych, psychologist therapy and group therapies and different activities that we have them involved in. Most of them are homeschooled. We have a couple of them that do go out to like a high school program that's kind of like half homeschool and half out. So we totally, you know, help them from a lot of these kids are not going to get reconnected to their parents. Sometimes their parents had something to do with, you know, the 
them, them becoming victims or things like that. So we have we get to have them for many years. So it's everything from you know one of our girls recently graduated from college with a degree in business. She's working at a, an exporting company down there. So just totally, you know, when you see how some of these girls or boys come in the beginning and then you just see them, you know, years later and getting a college degree and some of these things is like unbelievable to be able to see the, the amazing things God's been able to do down there and transforming, you know, these kids' lives for sure. Yeah, I love that, man. I mean, all the listeners, if you can just imagine being in the same situation, you know, if you can imagine being in that horrible situation and just kind of like the the cards that you've been dealt with, right? Or just realizing how you're not in that situation and how freaking blessed you are. I really do encourage you guys to open up your hearts right now and open up, you know, open up your wallets, (laughs) open up your wallets because funds right now are needed. You know, even if, even if your bank account's low, if, if you just lost your job, this is never the better time to, to invest in something that is going to tremendously impact other people's lives, which I guarantee you that it will, it's going to be a boomerang effect and it's going to smack you with a ridiculous ROI. So I really do encourage you to open up, uh, open up your wallets and jump online as well. And what is the website again? It's I N hearts. Thank you guys so much. So yeah, it's I N hearts.org. Okay. Inhearts.org. So this is what I want to do. I want to do, and we've never done this by the way, for, for anybody. I, I really do believe that this is, this is something that's going like it's needed right now. There, mm-hmm. There's a lot of chaos as, as you watch the news, as you see other people struggling out there. And mm-hmm. these are average, like everyday people. Can you imagine a nonprofit that, you know, they don't make money anyway. It's, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's very tough to actually keep these things alive and going. So, mm-hmm. So I, I really do encourage, I feel led to just start off. I'm going to give $500 towards this. I want everybody else. I really have a goal to get 5,000. Wow. So I encourage you guys to, to jump on here. I N And for everybody that does donate, whether it's big or small, it doesn't matter. Just donate something and, you know, see, see the blessing that comes back. I'm going to give an hour of my time to, to reach out to every single person. All you got to do is DM wow, that's me huge. and uh, just DM me and show me a screenshot of you actually supporting uh, Larry's nonprofit. And then I'll give you an hour of credit repair. I'll give you guidance. Uh, normally it's $500 for an hour to, to get guidance from me. So I'll give you step-by-step how we can get your credit on the right path or how you can get huge ROIs, make good money uh, or real estate, whatever type of knowledge that you want, we can go over and I'll make sure that it's a huge ROI uh, for, for your, for your time and your donation. Um, I'll give you my time. Thank you so much, Brandon. That means the world to me To Yeah. Thank you to you and to Jen, man. That, that means a ton. Really, really appreciate your donation, your support. And yeah, to everybody that's, that's going to be donating, you know, your donation goes a long way, goes a hundred percent to support these kids and, yeah. and, and what we're doing right now. And, you know, please check out our Facebook and Instagram and keep up with, you know, the stories of some of the kids are truly amazing. And definitely just want to thank you for all the support. It's definitely when, you know, those times that you give without expecting anything in return are in my experience, the times that I've been, you know, blessed 10 times more than, than that, you know, so it's always, and you know, God has a way of testing us where he definitely knows that it hurts. And that's why, you know, he asks us to tithe even before, right. The first like 10 fruits. So it's like, you know, because that is, it has a way of really, I don't know, I guess revealing to him our hearts and showing that we trust him and, and that we care. So um, yeah, I just it means a lot to me that, that you make a donation, that you guys get involved, and you know it goes a long way for these kids for sure. You know these are these are definitely amazing young men and women that are going to grow up to to be world changers for sure. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, we love you, Larry. We we appreciate all you know everything that you're doing, uh, going above and beyond to to keep something like this established and and really creating the foundation. You know, it, it's a hell of a lot of leadership skills that that are needed to be able to and persistence to be thank able you. to keep something like this going. So we thank you and we commend you, brother. Um, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, for sure. So on Instagram, you know, at underscore Larry Tucker, or if you want to hit me up on, you know, email or, or text message with any questions in regards to loans, you know, if you go to a uh, website, www 
cardinalfinancial.com yeah. slash Larry Tucker. You can actually apply directly on that website for a mortgage loan refinance or purchase in most states. Uh, so if you guys wanted to get some financing help there, or if you guys just have some questions, you know, feel free to shoot me an email to Larry.Tucker, T-U-C-K-E-R at cardinalfinancial.com. Or, you know, my phone number as well, 619-988-5850. It's a good way to shoot me a text or call if you guys have any questions. Right now I'm quarantined in my home office, so I'm just helping people with their mortgage solutions and trying to come up with creative ways to help people refinance or access equity in their homes through, you know, HELOCs or cash out refis or different things like that. So, you know, just doing what we can to help if you guys have any questions. I love it. I love it. And then don't forget, guys, it's inhearts.org. Definitely reach out, get connected with Larry. He's an awesome individual. You're definitely going to learn a lot of gold nuggets. Just jump on a, on a quick phone call with him or supporting his organization. Like I said, my offer goes out to you guys extended forever. All you got to do is send a screenshot of you donating to the organization, big or small, doesn't matter. Just I, I do have a huge goal to get to, to 5,000. So let's, let's, uh, let's get close to that and really, or go above and beyond. I would, you know, that's what we're praying for right now. And the blessings will come back. I'm very, very excited to see and hear some good stories that come back afterwards. That would be Um, awesome. Thank you. So just so that you know, $5,000, that's literally like enough for, to, to be able to fund 10 kids through the program for a whole month. So that allows us to, to be able to provide, you know, all of our, all of our services from food, clothing to, you know, their therapy sessions and everything. Our cost is about, you know, $500 per child per month. So that allows us to, to be able to keep on 10, 10 kids for a month. So thank you so much. That, that goes a long way. Let's go. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Cool. So you guys can always reach me at brandonelliotinvestments.com. Otherwise, Instagram, it's Brandon Elliott Investments or Facebook.com slash Brandon Elliott Investor or Facebook.com slash Brandon Elliott REI. Make sure you send me a screenshot and then we can lock in. I'll send you my calendar link so we can lock in an hour for your call and uh, we can go over anything and everything that you want. I'll give you all my tips and tricks that you know we have in our course or whatever you need. And I'll give you my book as well, Action Driven, absolutely free. So you guys can get that. I do want to see this goal hit. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Don't let me down, listeners. Don't let me down. Don't let me down. You know, invest something and uh, and send me that screenshot. All right. I'm holding you guys accountable. All right. And as always, hit that subscribe button for Ready Set Go REI. And um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, as always, reach out. Anyway, guys, love you so much, Larry. You're the man. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Enjoy the rest of the quarantine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stay blessed. This has been another episode of Ready, Set, Go! Real Estate Investing Podcast, brought to you by Brandon Elliott. For more information, please visit BrandonElliottInvestments.com. Also, please don't forget to like, share, and leave a comment below. Thanks again for joining. Until next time, God bless.